Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Hello. Hey, thanks. <laughs> so welcome to Data and the Greater Good. This is this is a UX and Data presentation for today. All right, let's get a round of applause for for Sweet. This worked, it's amazing. Hi everybody, I'm delighted to be here with all of you. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and uh, we are not using my hashtag three tips because uh, this is not my session, so please use whatever hashtag. What is the hashtag, guys? Is there a hashtag? Let's UX and data. UX and data. Uh, UX data meetup, maybe? Should we do that? Or hashtag, <laughs> hashtag UX meetup data. Shall we use that, everybody? Is that okay? Okay, so UX data meetup, all one word. Okay, with a hashtag. All right. Uh, so I am just delighted to be here and uh, to be with all of you, and especially my former museum colleague, Catherine, who is CDO of the Natural History Museum. What an amazing title that is, and a, and a great job. And uh, she was one of the first people who uh, came to see me at the Met very early, and uh, I learned a lot from what the Natural, Muse Natural History Museum is doing. Uh, we're, I'm going to share a little bit about this idea of, uh, of greater good and data and, and greater good. And I'll just tell you a little bit about my, my background. I was uh, a professor at Columbia University and the Columbia Journalism School for 21 years. And I left everything I know to go work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art as the chief digital officer. And I gave up full free tuition for my kids at Columbia, half tuition anywhere in the world. It's all pre-tax dollars. and. It's about $1.1 million that I left behind on the table. And this is a moment where you think I'm completely crazy and you should actually walk out and have more pizza because how would you trust anything coming out of my mouth after that? And, but I said, I'm leaving $1 million behind, but I'm getting 17 Van Goghs, so it's a good deal. <laughs> and I said this at an international group that thought I was actually, had somehow gotten a Van Gogh. And I did not get a Van Gogh. You should know that it's really important that you understand this. And uh, I, Absolutely loved my three years at the Met, but they had financial difficulties, so I left. And I'll share a little bit about what I learned in, in the process. And um, among the things that I want to just make sure you have are, the, this is a slideshow that I use for my presentation about social media in general. And you can um, just take a picture of this so you have the slides. Uh, just three, you see that bit.ly slash three status report. And you also have my email address, my Twitter handle, my Instagram, and my LinkedIn. Anyone here on LinkedIn? Raise your hand. How many of you know what you're doing on LinkedIn? See the hands fall or you turn into an Indian dancer, right? Like the, the reason is that even it's 2018, I first wrote about LinkedIn in 2005 and people still don't use it. Why? Because we think LinkedIn is a job hunting tool, which it is but it's a career management tool. I believe every ninth grader should get on LinkedIn and have that for the his, rest of his or her life. I think it's that important. And there's a data component to it. And what is that? That they have taken LinkedIn and made it so much better. And the amount of data you get out of it is really good. They, don't, they did shut down the API. So for developers, it's not good. But as users and consumers of data, the amount of stuff you get back from LinkedIn. So uh, my one suggestion to all of you in terms of LinkedIn is take what you're already posting on Facebook and take it and just throw it on Twitter once, uh, sorry, on LinkedIn once a week and see what happens. The data you get back is so informational and so useful to you that you will start to use it more and more. So I encourage you to use LinkedIn. I also want to invite you to my closed Facebook group called Sri's Advanced Social. You can just go on Facebook and type in Sri apostrophe S Advanced Social. You'll find that it's... Um, one of the most useful places on, on Facebook, and not because of me, but because of the community we've built there, uh, people who've taken my classes from around the world, but also really good uh, senior people from Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all of these platforms, the CEO of Foursquare, they're all on there. So you ask a question, someone will answer, and there's somebody awake somewhere in the world. And so I encourage you to use that. And uh, also, if you'd like to sign up for my newsletter, you can. And all of this, again, is found off those slides with that first link. And then all the way at the bottom are all my best social media tips on one single slide, or some, one single page, which is that Bitly link at the bottom. And I also want to make a plug for Bitly. Any Bitly users here? Everybody should have their own Bitly account. It's a free service, and you can 
get your own account and you can then do this. You can remember all your web pages because you can customize it. It's free and I encourage you to use it. They do a lot of interesting things. Uh, the New York Times to Pepsi to Target, everybody uses Bitly already, but you don't see the word Bitly, right? You see their personal, their customized accounts like NYT.MS and PEP.SI, those are all Bitly. And uh, it's a really good service, especially for those of you who are interested in data. Uh, one of the things I was mentioning earlier is that with data comes obviously the chance to learn, but also the chance to be disappointed and the chance to like, it's always better when you didn't know in some cases, right? So uh, one of the tools, one of the apps I love is called Moment. Has anybody played with this? M-O-M-E-N-T. It tells you how many times you've touched your phone. And pick a number and guess what that is and then you actually use the service and it's like five to 10 times more than what you thought. So it was better when you didn't know. And I come from a world of journalism where not knowing was how we operated. We didn't know anything about our data and we were very happy with that. So we imagined if we had an article in Time Magazine, one million people read it. When in fact, almost nobody read it, they just kind of flipped through the covers or whatever, right? Like it's true in every publication. Uh, I used to be on TV in New York a lot. I was on the Today Show dozens of times. I was on the local news channels 600 times in the, in the 2000s and nobody watched me. Even in my home, nobody watched me. And once I started getting the data, it was really scary. Otherwise, I just presumed everybody was watching me and knew what I was, uh, knew what I was talking about, but nobody was. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. And I want to pull out a couple of ideas from my work with purpose-driven companies. So I uh, went to the Met, and I had a great time there. And then I lost my job at the Met and, uh, because they were restructuring, and so I was asked to leave. And then I became, so I was Chief Digital Officer of Columbia, then Chief Digital Officer of the Met, and then I became Chief Digital Officer of New York City, and I was reorged out of that job. And so I lost two jobs in 12 months. And uh, it is great for character building, but almost nothing else. And for those of you like Catherine who haven't seen, who hasn't seen me in a while, my character has improved dramatically. So, you know, uh, I do not recommend this uh, happening to you, but uh, I do encourage you to kind of think about, um, about building your network when you don't need it, so that it's there when you need it. And that's one of the lessons from, uh, from this. Everything you're seeing today is being presented off my phone, and um, I'm doing that on purpose. Not only is it from my phone, but everything you see here was created on the phone. And I'm using Google Slides to do that. Why? Because I think, that all of us are constantly creating content, these beautiful two, three monitors on our desktops, but everything's being consumed on the phone. That doesn't mean you stop using your beautiful monitors, but try to create more stuff on your phone if you can, because that's where our consumers are living. And so especially if you're a purpose-driven organization where you're dealing with catering to people who often don't have the best screens and the best technology, thinking about how you're creating it for those kinds of folks I think is really important. So I hope you will think about that in your work as you're, as you're doing it. And so after um, losing my second job in 12 months, I decided I'll never wear a tie again, except at weddings and funerals, and I will uh, not work for anybody except as a consultant. And so now I do social media coaching and consulting. And in that process, I'm working with some interesting organizations that I want to tell you about a couple of them because I think uh, you will get some ideas about how, how they use data. One of them is this particular institution. We love the Natural History Museum, but here's another kind of museum. Anyone recognize this? Probably not, because you haven't been there. It's only three months old, a little more than three months old. It's called the Louvre in Abu Dhabi, the new Louvre Museum in Abu Dhabi. We live in a world where there's a new Louvre in Abu Dhabi and Donald Trump might win the Nobel Prize. Yes. That's coming. It's, it is a really unusual world, right? Uh, and uh, this is one of our, um, this is, uh, I, I've always said that I wanted their motto to be, hey, come to the Louvre Abu Dhabi where we have 14 lifeguards. How is that for a piece of data? That's intriguing, right? Why do they have 14 lifeguards? Well, you can actually see one of them right, right there. Do you see him right here? And that's because Jean Novel, the great architect, French architect, has built the Arabian Sea into, the Arabian Gulf into the museum and the art. It's spectacular. 
And uh, I urge you, if you get to Dubai, it's an hour by Uber, and uh, go check it out. And this is not even the art, right? This is just the architecture. But um, what they are doing there in terms of data is making sure that they are doing something that's unusual for the rest of us, those of us who have millions of objects as you do at, the, uh, at Natural History or at the Met where there's one million objects. There they only have 300 objects. And they're telling the stories of those 300 objects and they're building it up as they're going along. You almost never get a chance to see that. Most museums open with 10, 20, 30,000 objects. Here they're doing it with just 300 and they're getting you a chance to kind of learn about each of them as they're doing it. So it's a very special use of data and I encourage you to, uh, encourage you to check out what, 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 they're, uh, what they're doing on there. By the way, one of the objects that they recently got, you may have seen, the world's most expensive painting, the last Leonardo in the wild that was sold for $450 million. It's coming there in October. So you can um, take a look at that if you're interested in, in art. I'll also show you here a example, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, this is fun, fun with your phone, right, when you, when you are, okay, here we go. Here's, here's a piece of data that I wanted to show you. So when I was at the Met, we used to say that our job is to tell a million plus stories about our million plus pieces of art to a billion people. And this is the content we used to create in one year at the Met. And if you're a publishing organization, you're creating that in some fashion, maybe more, much more or much less than this. But having this data and tracking it was really important to us. And we were able to do this properly uh, in a way because we got our first data analytics person at the Met. And why, why was that important? Because the Met, like most museums, is really good at collecting data and tracking how many people are in the building and how much money people gave. But understanding our digital metrics was almost non-existent at the Met. And then I met this amazing um, uh, digital expert who I, uh, who I thought was terrific. She was at the, um, at, at the Tate. And so uh, we brought her to America. We hired her, we brought her to America, and now she's here. And her uh, Twitter handle is Ella Nustica and I encourage you to follow her. And you can also say hi, she's standing, sitting right over there. Uh, wave, Elena, Elena Via Espesa, but her Twitter handle is Elenustica, and follow her. She has a PhD in social media of museums. You didn't even know there was such a thing. <laughs> and she has that, so you can call her doctor. And uh, she just does incredible work, and she has this uh, data site called Arts Metrics artsmetrics.com, where she blogs about stuff. Is your whole thesis on there, your dissertation? Yeah, yeah the, if, you, you know, if you have a lot of time, you can read her dissertation. But she takes insights and shares them. And what she did to change the museum culture is hard to uh, explain or, or hard to justify. But one of the things she did was build out um, uh, our, the way we used to report our own information was quite, uh, quite difficult to understand. And what she did was, she said that the important thing is not to drown your bosses in data and information about everything we're doing, but to focus on just a few things. And this is what I want to show you. And here we go. So it's going to come up. So what, what we did was, or what she did, I didn't do any of this, this is all her, was take our information and make it into one page uh, documents that you could look at. Sorry, here we go. Okay, so let me just go here and here we go. Mm. So you're seeing here for the first time that she created these one page insights that changed the museum and changed the culture of the museum because suddenly we understood what was going on digitally in the museum. And I've been talking a lot about museums and you may be in other fields, but the same idea applies that we generate so much content, we generate so much data, but no one understands it. And part of our job is to teach our bosses what, what points of data are important and what's not important. So here, looking at, looking at things uh, about the opening, these are our annual statistics, and presented in this single one-page format it was just kind of beautiful and elegant, and it made a big difference in people understanding everything that was going on at the Met. And uh, the instinct is to create pages and pages of data. Instead, 
pick out one thing and do this. By the way, I still, I love this project, one of my favorites called Meow Met, where it's a Google Chrome extension where you get a free cat from the Met collection every time you open a new browser, so it's really fun. And you can see how they're, how they're using it. It was built by in our media lab. Here are some traffic trends, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So think about simplifying as much as possible. In our projects at the Met, the, new, the current CDO, my uh, deputy and my successor, Loic Talon, always talks about how you, when, you create con when you create projects, make them simple, useful, and delightful. Simple, useful, and delightful. And in fact, most nonprofits do the exact opposite of that, right? Like, how can we get it more complicated, more difficult, more hard to understand? And so I encourage you to think about doing this and talk to Elena about how she does this. Uh, she's been blogging about it, tweeting about it for a long time. So uh, definitely follow up, uh, follow up with her. And um, I'm going to just look at Matt to figure out how much time I have left so I can take maybe a couple of questions. And then I have just a thing to end with. So Matt's going to give me the hook yeah, here in a second. You know, Point for your rap, yeah, so why don't we take a couple of questions and I'll wrap with a, a short thing I want to show you. Yeah. Hi. Um, so what, just being a bit ahead of the meta, I wonder what were some of the actual items that the data that you found that you were able to make recommendations to them? Uh, sure, sorry. Uh, yeah, so what we, one of, so here's, here's an example. Until, uh, until very recently, the Met had no idea if when people walked into the Great Hall, if they turned right or left. Did they go to Egyptian or they go to Greek and Roman? They had no idea because there's no way to track that. And from our audio devices, there was uh, data for the first time that we were able to glean and know that X percentage turn right, X percentage turn. It's not, it was, it was you know, not everybody takes the, takes the um, uh, guides, but that was an example of then you can plan for it. And again, Elena will have a lot of ideas. Another was that uh, people weren't using the audio guides as much as we thought. Even in museums, when it's free, people don't take it. So we took the uh, audio content and put it on SoundCloud and put it on the web because the goal was to get it out there more than like make, I mean, of course it was to make money, but could we continue to make money and give it away was the test, and we were in that particular case. Obviously, if we had done all the money part right, I would still have a job, but I don't. One more question? Question. Yeah. Um, let me get the microphone. Oh, yeah, sorry. Michael. Yeah, anybody else have a question? Okay, so I'm going to leave you with two things. One is to make a plug for my flagship event. It's called Social Media Weekend, and Elena is actually presenting at it. And it's June 1 and 2 at CUNY, and there's a code for 30% off right on the screen, and I hope some of you will come to it. It's June 1 and 2, it's a Friday, Saturday, and it's a lot of fun and you'll learn a lot of things. And I wanted to leave you with this very unusual video that I saw today, and it's about data. We talk a lot about social media, that's the world I live in, and I work with, uh, as, as you heard, some museums, but I also work with the UN Refugee Agency, I work with uh, t Global Teacher Prize, App Teacher Prize, we give one teacher $1 million in the world, it's like the Nobel Prize of Teaching, work with the Pulitzers, and in all of them, I say to all of them the same thing that I'm saying to, uh, to you folks, that as you're collecting your data, make sure you're telling stories with it. Humanize the data, make it about the people, make it about your staff, make it about the people you help, and that will matter. So I'm gonna just play this video, um, if the video plays, it's only 58 seconds. Let's see. So I'll just pause here, anybody know who that is? That's the co-founder of Facebook that most of us don't hear about. This is Chris Hughes, at Chris Hughes. And he is amazingly uh, uh, someone who has cares so much about poor people that he's written a book called Fair Shot, which is about this, and he started something called the Economic Security Project. And listen to his idea. We're our phones and our cars, even with our thermostats. We are the product. We are the product, We are creating immense amounts of data. And at the same time, a small group of companies is, is, is creating historic levels of profits from it. So the idea is to say, let's strike a bargain. Yes, these companies can and should innovate. We want that kind, we want technology to move the world forward. We also want to make sure that all this data that people are creating is protected, number one, and two, that people can share in the upside. So royalty, call it 5% on the revenues of companies that profit from consumer data, goes into a sovereign wealth fund, and then it cuts out a dividend check. Like the Alaska Every oil fund. fund. There's a template for how to do it in Alaska. Right. So you're talking about oil. Oil. Um, the, the idea is, some of you like that idea. Okay, so the idea is 
that all these companies are collecting our data. We are the product. We are the data. You've heard that. And um, the profits, 5% of their profits, go into a sovereign fund and you get universal basic income. So most every American would get a check for a couple hundred bucks, I guess. And there is a precedent for it that I've never heard of in Alaska. If you're an Alaskan resident, you get money from their oil exploration. So it's a provocative idea, and it was uh, given out today at the Milken Institute. Uh, so I'd, I just wanted to leave you with that as you kind of think about data and greater good, about making it kind of the public good. And uh, uh, if I can ever help you with anything, please let me know. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. It's a real pleasure for me to be here, and I thank uh, the organizers for that. Uh, I always went right to the Egyptian side of the museum, so I'm one of the statistics on, uh, on that side. So I'm going to talk about uh, mathematical models and data science that we've been working on uh, related to sustainable peace in the world. So what, what does that mean? So most previous research studies have analyzed peace only in a negative way as the absence of conflict. But there's been growing an effort over the last few years to understand positive peace, that is, the political, economic, and social systems that sustain peaceful societies. And I work with a group called AC4 uh, at Columbia University that's headed by Peter Coleman. That's one of the groups that's working on these conditions of positive peace. And this is a very multidisciplinary, multinational group, uh, including uh, people, Philip Vanderbach from uh, Brussels and Danny Burns from the United Kingdom, and people in the US, including anthropologist uh, Doug Fry in Alabama. And starting about three years ago, this group started by doing a literature review and then a survey amongst people in different scientific fields that led to a small workshop and a larger workshop to try to gather information. And this has included also people from the United Nations and the World Bank and the Omidia Group, uh, which is from Pierre, Pierre Omidia from eBay, who's been giving a lot of money to social courses. And so starting from this original research, they developed what they call a causal <coughs> loop diagram, which I'll show in a moment that tries to identify the factors involved in peace and the interactions between those factors. And what I do for this group is I was able to use that diagram to develop a mathematical model and a graphic user interface so non-computer people could actually use it. And what we're starting to do now is use data science methods to test, improve, and eventually we hope validate that model and use quantitative data from both databases and social media. So, so this is what uh, this uh, causal loop diagram looks like. And basically, it's got a center core, which is the most important part, so they've abbreviated it too much, which is sort of problems academics do. But basically, what they think is going on that's most important in order to sustain peace is positive or negative reciprocity. So if some other group does something good for you, do you do something back for them? Or do you do something nasty to them? And that's sort of the core, they think, of the glue that holds society together. And some of the other things that play into that, excuse me, that play into that are things like people's memory of the past, how emotionally do they feel about the past, because that determines how they act in the, in the present and also people's uh, expectations of what their future is going to be, and a whole bunch of these other factors. So these social scientists are trying to lay out all the things that they think are important. So to me, all these things influence each other. You should be able to figure out, if you have some mathematics, where they all wind up. So that's what we're doing here. So this is a, a picture of our graphic user interface. On the right hand are all these factors put together. Uh, the red arrows indicate things that are negative effects, and the blue arrows are positive effects. 
Um, and if you click on the button that says calculate, these are really sets of ordinary differential equations. And you probably haven't heard that phrase often, sets of ordinary differential equations. But um, I'm allowed to use that phrase, I mean, <laughs> dispensation. So uh, if you click on the calculate, what it will do is uh, advance these val values in time <coughs> and compute how they're all interacting with each other and where they wind up. And what happens at the end of the calculation is we redisplay these now with text sizes that are proportional to the values of variables. So you see some that are much bigger and some that are much smaller. So we're trying to convey to someone using this what happens. And we can use the screens on the left here to change the initial values of variables before you press calculate. Or if you click on one of the variables, we'll pull up a different screen uh, so that you can change the connections from one variable to another. So it allows you to play with the system to change things and see what would happen if you do other things. So this is what user design looks like to an academic who doesn't know user design. But this was an attempt to try to make something graphic that people could communicate with. And this shows two examples of models that we've been working with. In the upper left is a model where the factors are very sparsely connected to each other. And if we run this model forward in time, what we get on the right shows that these um, uh, reddish uh, factors, which are bad factors, actually dominate in this model. So this model goes to a bad place. On the one on the bottom, on the lower left, has a lot more globally connected things. And in that case, when we run this forward in time, it goes to a good place. So we can use this to try to see if we think different models are present in different places where things wind up in the long run. So what we're trying to do now is actually measure some of this stuff to see whether it's all bullshit or not. So uh, what we're doing is looking, um, to say it in full jargon, both structured and unstructured databases. So for example, in terms of social media, one of the important things are connections between different groups. So uh, what two of my students have been looking at are people who are using uh, Britain First hashtag and Refugees Welcome, which are two groups of people that have pretty different feelings on refugees, and then look at other elements in their tweets to see if they could identify which <coughs> football teams, and this is London and Belfast, so this is real football, mm -hmm. uh, and see if they can um, identify whether people who have these very divergent opinions in those two different bars are really fans of the same football team. And it's actually, for most of these teams, they are. So whatever else is going on here, there's some interconnection in this society between different groups of people. And that's usually a healthy thing. Um, another one of my students has been trying to get an estimate of people's emotional, historical memory and future expectations. So she's defined a, a series of words that seem to refer to the past in other words, that refer to the future. And then we've been looking for those words in tweets and doing what's called a sentiment analysis that is looking at the emotional positivity or negativity of the other words in the tweets. And at least for the two week time period around uh, right before New Year, she looked at, and again, this is again in London and Belfast, that people's view of the future was a lot more positive than the past and a lot more positive than random tweets. And actually, this was pretty statistically significant. But this is before New Year's. Apparently, people are pretty positive about what's going to happen next. And we've seen a change in this a little bit. Uh, and what we're trying to do now is to see how this sentiment tracks with other uh, external events. So what we learned from doing all this is, first of all, there are real challenges in this. The uh, social scientists are pretty sure they know what they mean when they say things, but that makes it real hard for me to actually measure the things they say. And so getting operational definitions to go out and measure something uh, is, is really hard. And actually getting the data can be hard too, or quantifying it. And there are real issues in terms of uh, user experience design here. 
how do you present a lot of complicated data to people who are not used to seeing real quantitative data? And even more importantly, what sort of interface do you want to design so people can actually play with the data and have a response so they're going to learn something? And these are our problems or issues that are present in a lot of scientific situations. And I think most of the things you've been dealing with are, um, which is my guess, are of people sitting in front of their machine or their mobile device and, and interacting with that. And those people really aren't dealing, they're dealing with a lot of information, but it's not sort of the information that's dealing with a lot of detail. And to present a lot of detail, especially Sri was saying in a very simple, clear way, is, is actually very difficult. The other thing we found is that a lot of our results are situationally dependent. That sometimes in some of the models we look at, there's a single important factor. And if you change that, it's going to make a big change in the system. There's a leverage point. But other times, it's many little factors that are much more important. And this means that in different situations, achieving peace, what achieves peace in one place may not work in another place. But at least we're trying to do this, at least by using new sort of methods that are relatively new in social science, by using mathematical models, by using data science. And the practical lessons for policymakers are, and the policymakers don't want all this complexity. They want us to tell them, you should do this one thing, and that one thing is going to work. And we keep trying to tell them we don't know that one thing, which is not surprising, consider human history. But, you know, they are looking for something that we can't quite provide. But we can provide, at least in these models, a feeling of what complex systems do. So one of the things that complex systems do, they fall into valleys called attractors. And you can nudge your system, but it keeps falling back into the same valley. And complex systems have other properties like that. So just having this mathematical model for them to play with, even if it doesn't refer to anything specific, is still a good learning exercise. But what we'd like to do is get to a specific model that has predictive analytics that we would like to have validated by empirical data. And if we can do that, and that's sort of the direction we'd like to do, but it's a very difficult task, then we could predict the consequences of interventions in systems and so avoid these unanticipated consequences, which seem to very often happen in a lot of real life situations. And if this isn't enough, this is the link to my website. Uh, there's actually a 45-minute version of this, uh, of a talk I gave in Florida in March, when it was snowing here in New York. Uh, and that has more details. And besides this, one of the things I've been doing at Queens College is I teach a physics course uh, for computer science students. And I've been updating this course to include a lot more sort of modern physics and things like quantum computers and uh, things like that. And that course is uh, on YouTube, and both of these links are from my web page. And in line of what Tree says, actually some of these videos have between zero and three uh, watches on them. So this is an opportunity for you to get in on the ground level uh, on this course. All right, thank you. We have a, well, I seem to have a dead mic, but we have enough, oh, hi there. So we have enough time for, I think, two or three questions. We have our first question over here, just, hey there. Hi. Uh, so one of the disciplines I didn't hear mentioned when you talked about the multidisciplinary approach was history, and which is something you would think would be relevant, but also something that doesn't tend to generate kind of models and data that can be easily translated into a, this sort of thing. I wonder if you could comment on that. So I don't remember immediately, I may not have listed all the disciplines whether we had any historians on the initial survey that we did. So I just don't remember whether they weren't were. There's a big if, uh, um, effort right now in digital humanities in doing a lot of things like looking through records of what people sent back and forth at different times 
and analyzing those records by using some data science techniques to maybe get other information about what was going on. So I agree with you, having a historical perspective would also be helpful here, but some of these tools are having the reverse effect too, of being able to dig into data um, from events. So one of, the, one of the people we work with uh, has been involved, um, I guess about 15 or 20 years ago in a peace process in Mozambique. And there were actually a lot of data records as they went through to make different agreements. And um, you know, one of the things I think they were trying to do was to go through that data record. So I think this works both ways in terms of learning from history and applying new techniques to history. Uh, I'm wondering if you uh, studied or seen the different impact to people that approach uh, information like you're showing your video versus reading text, reading, just reading, reading books, reading. You know, how the difference of involvement and understanding of what's going on. I think that's a, that's a very interesting question. I think different. Uh, I actually reread uh, Marshall McLuhan's book not so long ago. Uh, but um, I, I think people have different relationships and different impacts in the media that, 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 that they're doing. I think it's been a bigger challenge, again, to go back to what Sri was saying, it's been a big, bigger challenge to present how do you present quantitative information. And I don't have anything immediate or clever to say about the difference between reading and looking at something graphic, but they are different different things and they can affect people differently. It's one of the But I'm saying it looks like we're moving more and more to a video and away from it. Yeah, I think, I think we probably are moving more toward video. I don't know if I'll do it this year. Previous times I've taught my classes, instead of people writing term papers, I've had them make four minute videos. <coughs> and either showing a computer program they did or explaining something from the class, because I thought that's the skill they should have in the world at the moment. And um, they get into deep trouble if it's more than four minutes. <laughs> okay, time for one more question. Um, your work is fascinating. Thank you for telling us about it. Um, um, is it part of a bigger trend or um, wave of research to looking into um, social science and kind of using it as future predictive models? Are there other efforts happening in this, in this world? Yeah, so, so it, just in terms of sustainable peace issues, there is a minority of people, but an increasing number that have done an, a, a lot of that. So, so this sort of emphasis on peace rather than absence of war is a big thing. Um, in terms of, um, uh, what were you asking, in terms of... Uh, Social science data. Yeah, yeah, so, so there, are, there are a lot of the things, that, thanks, there are a lot of things that are going on in social science in terms of uh, analyzing data, for example, from combat zones or in terms of um, uh, in social media, or in terms of agent-based models, or in terms of other types of mathematical models. So right, in, and, and one of the areas is actually studies of networks. So this model is also a network. So there's a lot of research going on into understanding how uh, things go viral on the internet, or how things spread. Or if you had a network, how do you identify the most important pieces? Or, or you know, what roles people are serving on Twitter, whether they're passing information, whether they have, um, they're vetted in some way by other people so they have value. So there's a lot of mathematics of this going, going on right now. All right, thank you very much, Larry.